Hello everybody, James Green, Short Series Shenanigans. So this is episode three in the final episode for the uh, teen up for the lathe. So <clears throat> we ran into a bit of a snag and you guys see the videos on the other channel, the first two that I did. Uh, because of the unique thread for this, I had to order the, the tap and I went ahead and ordered a die because it is a 14 by 1.5, not a very common even automotive application because you know I even checked at my auto parts store so I ordered this I got online I found it and I've already got the die put in my dies set but I was able to pick up a set that have a taper plug and tap so these were actually picked up from an individual on eBay a company that had them uh, relatively inexpensive for I don't do this type of stuff all the time. Now, if this was a common thread pitch that I did all day, every day, all the time, then I would buy the really, really expensive high end. This set was about $20 shipped for the three. And uh, we're working in soft material. We know because we've tested this uh, <coughs> with our material tester, uh, with our PTC uh, hardness tester, and it was 20. <coughs> Excuse me on the Rockwell scale. So these will work fine. They're high speed steel taps or, or they're for working in high speed steel. Um, they're just regular taps. You have a taper, a plug, and a tap. Yes, they're import. What you will find is most metric uh, threads, especially left hand. If you're looking for left hand stuff, again, I've talked about this in other, other videos. Depending on your application, and I've purchased a lot of left hand taps and stuff, and dies from overseas and I've had good luck with them. Um, again, depends on the type of material you're doing. If you're doing a lot of left hand stuff all the time, then it, again, you gotta remember, these only last so long and then they lose their edge and you have to throw them away. And I i don't know how many times I've seen tap and die collections. Guys have them and you go look at them and there's teeth busted out of some of the dies and some of the taps are, you know. So you gotta remember, these wear out. Yeah, you can try to sharpen some of these uh, touch them up if, if you have really, really expensive ones or they're a really, really proprietary thread and you have the proper tool and cutter die grinder equipment like a KO Lee tool cutter grinder, which if I had room in here, honestly, I'd have one. But I'm going to do and set up and do some sharpening and stuff on, on the, on the uh, Gertrude, but that's later. But, you know, so taps, yeah, consumable item. After they wear out and they don't cut anymore, throw them away. But these should last me for what I'm doing. We're in some soft material. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and get set up. And <clears throat> what I did just to make this easier, because when I started out, you guys, I've had some people ask, they're like, why did you spend so much time milling so much material off? As you guys know, I have very limited space here. The only bandsaw I have that's a vertical bandsaw does not have bimetal blades. I need to get some made for it. It's the shopsmith. Right now it's just got the regular high speed steel. I cut aluminum and wood and plastic on it. My uh, horizontal bandsaw, yes, but trying to clamp a small piece to do an oddball cut, it's difficult. So that's why I went ahead and chose to just spend a lot of time milling the side off. Now I did find, I went to the metal store after I had started this project because I had to pick up some stuff, metal for some other stuff. I did pick up some material that was not as wide. So it was pretty close, inch and a half. This is one inch, uh, 440 thou. So very little milling involved. Uh, so a lot more conducive to, if you guys want some of these, uh, and I do these videos, and let's say you have the Logan lathe, or you need a T-nut built, holler at me, because I, I, I bought a stick of this material that's uh, cold roll, 1018, and I can harden it. Hit me up, holler at me, my public email address, eagledustoff37 at gmail.com very inexpensive and what I am going to do is when I get done I'm actually going to harden this in my heat treating oven. Now I'm not going to show all that on video I'll probably show it in another video after it's been done but we are going to harden this because we know that repeated torquing and that's why we checked it with our hardness tester it is soft material so we know <clears throat> and we've done a little we'll test we'll do this and I'm going to do several of them at the same time when I go to harden them so I'm going to actually make up a couple of these um, that are this same thread pitch and harden them. So if you guys happen to have this same lathe and, it ha and you buy one of these quick change tool posts and it has a 14 by 1.5 thread pitch in here and you need a Tina and you don't have a way to make one, holler at me and uh, via email and we'll discuss it. 
very inexpensive and uh, definitely worth it. So I'm going to go ahead and show you some, some some tricks I do for layout. I went ahead and just to get this down to, I wanted to get it a little bit smaller than the dimensions so I knew he had room. And I went ahead and surface ground, playing with the surface grinder. And so I spent time, you know, really dressing up. Uh, of course, I had already surfaced ground the bottom, so I know I would have a flat surface to start out when I was milling and everything. And, you know, we just touched up the edges, made it real nice and smooth and pretty, and even the top. So, just because I wanted to, you know, make sure you put out, your work speaks for yourself. So now all we have left to do, literally, is drill tap and deburr that, because everything else has been deburred, literally, and then we'll put it in the heat treat oven, and that'll be a whole separate deal. So one thing I'll do, even though I've got it marked, I'm going to show you guys a quick way where I like to do to find center. Again, with I've showed this on stuff like this on my live feeds that I'll do like on Facebook at time. But I will show you guys. So instead of having to use a wiggler and touch off and this and that and the other, here's another, another quick way to do it. It's really simple. Pull out your magic marker. Find the relative center. Let me go ahead and zoom you guys in here so you can see what I'm doing here. All right. So this is what I like to do at times. Okay, you come in here with your magic marker. I'll try to make sure you guys can see this. And we'll go ahead, even though we've already done it, and we'll just put some marker down in the middle, okay? And we take our guessimeters. All right, yes, these are left hand. I've had people ask about that, and they're like, are those left hand? Yeah, I've got them in this size and larger. And what I'll do, I'm going back so you guys can see what I'm doing here. All right, so we just grab the overall dimension, and we don't have to go down here. We're going to go up here where we already cut. So it is 850 thou, half of that. You just cut it in half and go 425. So bring it down to 425 thou. Lock it in and just hold the peak. Well, what you can do is slide it in the vise. Go ahead and lock it down. We'll get ready here. And then, so we've locked our, again, our decimeters in because we're just drilling a hole. It doesn't have to be super accurate. Scribe that and then move over to this side and scribe there. You know, so you actually hold on each side. And I'll try to get you guys in a little closer so you can see, you can see what I am actually doing here. I'll try to, uh, need a production crew. All right. I know this light may be washing this out. I'll move it back a little bit. So you guys can see exactly what I'm doing here with this. There we go. All right. So essentially what I did was just came over here, rested one on the back side, okay, and scribe. Came over here, rested on the front, and scribe. And we're going to do the same thing here. We're going to loose it up. We're going to get our dimension. And we're just going to come up here, does it? And we'll come here at the top. So we'll call it two one one two, or we'll just call it yeah. It's, so it's two one one two. Actually, we'll make sure we're zeroed. Okay. Come back up here. Make sure we're holding relatively the same. Okay. Two one one zero. We'll call that two one one zero. So one. 0, 0.50, 1 inch 50 thou. Maybe we'll just keep it simple, nothing super fancy. And then we come over here to this, and then again, you drop one edge down here, you can see. So we're dropping one edge here, and the other, this is we're scribing, and we just scrape. Same here, come over here and find a little bit of difference. And you can see, we left us a little mark. I'll pull it out and you guys can take a look at. And so we've that's one way to do it. Real quick, simple, using your basic tools. Okay. I can see the scribe lines and that'll work. So that's a real quick way of finding center of an item without having to use wigglers and touch off and all everything else. If you just want to do it quick, simple. One way, again, a different way of doing it. So we're gonna go ahead and lock this down. Now we've got our spot drill in here to start with. 
which is a 3 8 spot drill. And we've got our 18 m chuck in. Go ahead and loosen up everything. Clean the oil off the handle down here. Oil likes to drip off the uh, x-axis lock here. Okay, come in here. And we'll loosen the quill, come down. Get over here. And this, again, I like, you know, this isn't super exact because this part is going to set down in and slide. So, and then you can come in here and look at and touch off and center. And I come in here and touch off. All right. That'll work for what we're going to do. Let's lock the table. All right. And we're in. Now I'm going to walk over here. I'm going to turn on the rotary phase converter because it's not running yet. I love my American Rotary Phase Converter. I love it. It is very quiet compared to the old ones. All right. And let's see what are we in. Forward, we're going to be, should be 660. Yep. Drill size for our 14 by 1.5 is 12.5, <clears throat> and that is per the per the chart. So if you did not have a metric bit of 12.5, according to the chart here. The alternate would be, let's see, let's see, 12.15, okay, or 14.15, pre-drill is 12.5. If you do not have the 12.5, you can use a 3164. That's the imperial alternate, okay? And that'll get you your 72 to 75, or 72 to 77 percent thread depth per the chart. So we're going to go ahead and get started here, and I am going to actually slow this down. Go back here. Just because when we're starting out, I don't want it to jump all over the place. And sometimes starting a big bit until it gets its proper hole started, if you run pretty fast, you can actually chip your bit. Just hand feeding it here. Oh yeah. Cutting knives. Real soft material. What we'll actually do is engage the feed dog. There we go. And trying to get the feet engaged up here. Uh, there we go. Engage the down feet and we'll let it do its job. Set there and pull. You don't have to sit there and pull pressure. Just let the power down feed do its deal. Might as well use it, that's what it's there for. Makes a nice chip. It's got the correct sharpen and eat, sharpen factory angle on it still. If 
you ever want to stop, you just pop it out. Hanging up on me. There we go, we got it now. Get our chip to stop. Got a little more cutting. Cutting the wall just about through. bigger bits and you're getting up around half inch if you run them slower you're less likely to tear things up and you'll cut up especially since we're going to thread it you'll actually cut a more more round hole it's not going to be perfectly round because drill bits don't cut really really round holes unless you are uh, got a correct sharp point on them Tip's doing good. Still got factory edge on it. Set this over here out of the way. And this set has a taper, a plug, and a tap. And we've got it up on parallels. We've got plenty of room. So we're just going to go with a plug. And that'll do what we need to do. And we'll get the. Uh... Now, what's nice is having these big. Uh, 18 and 20 inch super chucks is because on a tap you've got to really clamp down on them because if you don't get a good bite on them this is what you don't want to use a keyless chuck when you're running a tap or you can use some guys will make tap holders but they all the, the heads vary a little bit so what I, I usually do is I'll have mine handy we'll get it all ready here and we're in low gear because we're tapping so we're just going to tap this, get the cutting wall on here, and hand up here on the tap so we can reverse out. And I always like to watch underneath. Coming right back out. And like I said, I always like to give a little upfeed pressure. So when the tap's done, I talked about this the other night. So when you're done tapping, if you let your tap sit there when you're coming out and just kind of reverse, it'll actually chew your threads out. So you want slight upward pressure on the quill when you're doing that. So you get it out. All right, take the tap out. When we're done with that. We got a nice clean hole. I'm going to give a light chamfer to that. And this is something I keep handy. I keep this on the lathe in the middle. Is I've got a countersink always handy. It's a 82 degree, I believe. These are always handy to have around. I use this one a lot of times. You can go back and just do a basic chamfer. You don't want to do too much. That's all we need, real soft material. Fill up that way, we'll get our tool back out of the way here. All right. Now if we want to make sure we'll blow the chips out of this. Sometimes you might want to make sure that on your part, we're going to take the part out of the mill bites at this point. Alright. And we'll have to deburr the bottom. And if you 
want, what you can do, you can do it two ways. I've seen guys hold, you know, hold it up in there and then hold the part against it, and you can do that. That's one way to do it. Or another way, we'll put it back in the vise. What I like to do, because I'm not a real big fan of uh, having parts in your hand that are small like that, and then hold them up against a mill or something with it running because they can slip out of your hand so easy or grab and tear fingers. So what I like to do is just throw it back in the vise and I always keep a deep burr handy. Got my Nova burr handy. So you just come in here, real gentle like. There we go. And if there was anything sticking up, yeah, it's gone now. So if you want to make sure your tap is still good, I mean that the hole that the threads from doing the uh, should be able to run it in finger tight. Okay, and we went past where we countersunk on the other side. So you should be able to run your tap through by finger. And so it's good, you can tell you've got good thread engagement. Because sometimes when you're doing the chamfer, chamfer after tapping, you can uh, booger the threads a little bit. So I, I usually like to run it through from the back side. That's another reason I like the hand deburr from the back and then run the tap through from the back just to you know chase the threads out from the front. That's kind of a little, a little me thing that I've learned that makes uh, life easy. And so there we go. Here's our part. Nothing fancy. Good to go. We'll go ahead and shut the rubbery phase converter off. Alright. So, there we go. Give you guys a little glance at it. So, what we're going to do from this point is we'll be putting this and we'll heat treat it and everything. Now, what I like to do because anytime you heat treat, dimensions can change depending on what you're doing. Okay. Metal, no matter what, I see guys do this or talk about this. Anytime you heat metal, and for those of you that weld out there, you know what I'm talking about. When you put a tack, the other side raises up and vice versa. Same thing when you heat treat. <clears throat> To make sure, again, this is like a little thing that I like to do, what I will actually do is, because I got the tap for this, is I'm just going to make a little slug, nothing fancy, of similar material, you know, it can be 1018 is fine. Uh, I'm going to make a plug that will go in here, or if you had a bolt, which, you know, depending on the coatings on them, you know, I like to use raw material and make it because hardware store fasteners if they they'll melt or they could bond end up welding too so what i'll do is i'll probably take a piece of 1018 because that's probably what this is a 1018 or something similar to it soft metal and i will make a plug and put in there for a couple of reasons once this gets hard it's really hard to run a tap through and chase threads just to make sure the threads hold up because this is going to be you know and quenched and everything I'll actually oil quench this uh, and I'll show you guys on another little video um, after I get it out so what I'll, I'll do is I'll make a plug for that or it, let's say you had an area that was an open space and you had two thin pieces for example like a uh, uh, a receiver on a rifle and you have an upper and lower tang and then where the stock fits in you actually need to put a block in there and then put some screws in and hold it because they can warp and bend and twist. So what I want to do, just as a, as a me thing, in these like this, I like to take uh, and just throw a plug in there. You know, and I'll make one real quick out of some 1018 cold roll. Throw it in there. Run it through the heat treat process. And when I get done, I pull it out. That way, I know the threads are good. I will run a tap through it just to make sure the same tap threads are good to go that's just something I've done that, that was the way I was taught when you heat treat stuff you know just to make sure your bolt holes hold their dimensions now this is pretty thick um, general a thumb is 
one hour of soak time for every inch of thickness. So if that's five eighths of an inch. So I will go ahead and let that soak at, because uh, I'm gonna do other pieces at the same time. I'm not gonna do just this one piece. So everything in there is gonna be generally the same thickness. That will soak at, let's see, let me think. Uh, we're gonna do, trying to off the top of my head. That's why I have an app. Oh, love these, got me a phone holder finally. So, and I stuck it right on a piece of aluminum. You guys can get these at O'Reilly's. I don't have the box, I got rid of it, but they're handy. That's why I have this heat treating app here. Let me pull it up real quick. So for those that are curious, there's this heat treating app here, okay? It's called, and you can get it at Google Play called Heat Treat. Okay, let it start up. And what I like to do is I'll show you guys find alloy. We'll just put in like 1018 for example. 1018. Non-sulfurized carbon steel. I don't know if you can see it on camera. And then it pulls up all my data. It tells you any and everything you ever want to know about your material but was afraid to ask. Uh, it's do not forge below 1670 recommended heat treating practice normalize at 1695 air cool annealing uh, heat to 1620 cool slowly preferably blah 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 quench uh, you can quench it in oil or liquid or salt bath because 1018 is pretty common so we're going to heat it uh, hardening and of course they tell you through everything and this is what I go by you can't remember everything and I sit here before even when I get ready to do it is I'll pull this up again because you don't try to remember everything unless you're doing the same metal over and over and over and over and over and then you've on my oven which is like the HT1 you can program in your recipe your how quick it you know I like it to build up as quick as possible sit heat soak cool down time where you're gonna let it cool naturally and a according to whatever material that's why I love this app so good you press the back button and you want to find another alloy you know let's see uh, 4130 and it tells you anything and everything you'd ever want to know about you know that metal and heating it whether you're going to anneal it uh, carburize it um, everything you ever want to know, you know, for, from forging, normalizing, annealing, rough machining, austenitizing, quench, temper, and finish machine, and it gives you a big, I don't know if it'll wash out on camera, gives you a big recipe right there of all those, yeah, depending on what you're doing, so it's a really, really good app. And again, it, this is from the Heat treat your Google Play Store. This is free, free. For, I, if you have a, you know, I recommend you guys get that. That's pretty handy. So I use it all. You can't remember stuff. Don't try to use the technology. It's there. So I hope you guys have enjoyed this little three-part series again. Uh, this was for Cody Teague for his lathe, and uh, thanks Cody for sending the project in. We've got another project from another viewer we're going to be doing. So if you guys have anything else, holler at me, little projects you want to send in and see on camera, eagledustoff37 at gmail.com. Like I always say at the every end of video, and I truly do mean it, take care of yourself and take care of your family, because at the end of the day, you and your family is all you got. And we'd like to give a special thanks to Hall Industrial Tool Supply, you guys call them, request a master catalog. Um, they're trying to get a new website up and uh, tell them I sent you. Uh, they're gonna start taking care of us on YouTube and uh, the YouTube machining community and the Facebook machining community. Until next time, you guys be safe. Get out in the shop and uh, you know what? Make some chips, this stuff is fun. We'll talk to you later, bye-bye.